thanks cool. everyone for coming. Um, I'm, I'll be your host for tonight, Kai Sandbrink. Let's start with a quick um, summary of what we're all doing. We're pleased to invite you to the PIPS Summer Symposium, where the fellows from the 2023 fellowship program will present their work. PIPS is a research initiative aiming to explore parallels between intelligent behavior in natural and artificial systems and to leverage these insights towards the goal of building safe and aligned AI. So there will be 20 minutes talk per speaker. Um, Guillaume, I'll give you a, or 25 minutes in total, I'll send a text to you um, for the five minute mark to get started. And so that you have, know that you have that amount of time left. Um, and then there will be five minutes of discussion. And here, a quick note to everyone um, that we are using the question and answer um, in order to be streamlined to the question and answer portal in Zoom. So you can write questions during the talk and other, you can actually also upvote and downvote on certain um, like questions that you find particularly interesting. And then when we come to the q and I'll pick out the questions that have the most votes and or are the most informative, um, some weighted combination of those and read them out to Guillaume directly because we just have a few minutes. Um, if you have more questions though, keep in mind uh, not to worry, there will also be breakout sessions at the end of the symposium. Um, so after all of the speakers have had a chance um, and have, have had ability to talk um, where you will be able to go into a breakout room with a specific speaker that you want and also switch between them. Um, so keep posted for that at the end. Now I'll quickly introduce Guillaume and then we'll get started with the first talk. Um, so Guillaume Corlewe is speaking about um, the role of model degeneracy in the dynamics of SGD, our first um, speaker for the tonight. And he has a background in cognitive science and is currently interested in working in interpretability of neural networks. Guillaume, um, take it away. I'll stop my video and be muted. Uh, yeah, thank you, Kai. I'll uh, I'll share my screen. Oh, you should be able to see my screen now. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Thank. Yeah. Thanks. Great. Yeah. Thanks for coming to my talk. Uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about the role of uh, singularities on uh, stochastic gradient descent. So the general motivation here is a new research uh, direction called developmental interpretability, where we want to understand uh, how uh, the internal representation gets shaped by the training of a deep neural network. Uh, in particular, we want to detect and understand phase transitions uh, in neural network during uh, training. And this approach is grounded in a theory called singular learning theory um, that uh, predicts a phase transition during the learning uh, of uh, statistical uh, models that are Bayesian, uh, and also explains generalization via the singularities of these models. So I will explain later what these singularities are. Um, and a general uh, point about neural networks is that they are singular statistical models. And as such, we are interested in understanding how the insight of singular learning theory, which is a, a theory of Bayesian statistics, uh, apply to uh, the uh, deep learning uh, training by stochastic gradient descent, uh, and specifically how uh, stochastic, gradient, stochastic gradient descent dynamics uh, depends on the singularities of the region of statistical models. So the main results here that I'm going to talk about is that uh, we find some agreement between um, SLT prediction and the distribution of stochastic gradient uh, trajectory, but sometimes SGD gets stuck and might not agree, might not seem to agree with uh, with SLT. Uh, but in an interesting way, because that's that's because the, the noise gets gets affected by the singular region. Uh, in particular, the singular region of the statistical model uh, tends to dampen uh, SGD noise uh, as uh, as SGD gets closer to a singular uh, to a singular region. Uh, and then we also present. I'm going to present some some work in progress on some exploratory analysis. Uh, linking stochastic stochastic gradient descent uh, distribution with uh, a Fokker-Planck equation. Uh, so I'm going to cover a bit of background now. So, uh, yeah, so a deep, a 
Deep neural network is, is a statistical model that approximates uh, some function, uh, which is, so a neural network is a composition of a fine and nonlinear activation function uh, by minimizing uh, an, empirical, an empirical loss um, via stochastic gradient descent. Uh, stochastic gradient descent is an optimization algorithm. Um, and uh, the stochasticity in, sto in, in stochastic gradient descent comes from the fact that at each time step, uh, we are uh, randomly randomly sampling some batches of fixed size uh, from the whole from the whole data, uh, and the weight of data of the parameters of the neural network are given by this differential stochastic uh, equation, which depends on the uh, batch gradient uh, of of the loss. Uh, when the when the batch become larger and larger, we uh, recover the usual uh, gradient descent. Um, yeah. So, what are singular? What are singular uh, singular models? So, for the purpose of these talks, uh, I'm going to take a more sp uh, specific uh, definition of singularity. Um, but the, the the key point here is that locally, uh, around some critical points, if we can uh, uh, if we can write our uh, loss function as a product of monomial. Um, then the singularity, like we say, yeah, we say that. Uh, the, the locally around the, uh, the critical point W star is singular if some of this uh, degree of this exponent is strictly greater than two, which means basically which means that you, you can't you can't make a, a quadratic approximation around uh, around a around a, a minima of the loss. Um, and geometrically, the intuition is that there are some direction where the loss landscape will be flatter and you will have a larger volume around the around the local minima. So here I, I plotted an example of a potential uh, given by W1 square and W2 four. And uh, along the direction W2, you have a uh, something which is a power to the four, and it's 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 the, the around the local minima, everything is is a bit flatter because of this, uh, yeah, because of this singularity. Um, okay, so one of the main results uh, of the um, singular of singular learning theory, which has been developed by a mathematician called Sumio Watanabe, is the free energy formula. So, as I said, singular learning theory is a, a theory of Bayesian statistics, and uh, generally we can write the posterior the Bayesian posterior as a, a likelihood term and a prior term, and we rescale everything by Zn, which is a partition function. So yeah, you have to imagine that we take our parameter space and we partition our parameter space into uh, subspace, uh, this omega alpha that uh, I will uh, call uh, phases. Um, and I, we can define the free energy of, uh, of the phases as minus the log of the partition function over, uh, over these phases. And the partition function itself measure the, measure the volume of the Bayesian posterior uh, in, in that region. Um, and, and in Bayesian, in Bayesian statistics, a uh, statistical model, uh, the, the Bayesian posterior tend to behave such that we, we want to see where the Bayesian posterior accumulate the most, uh, which is equivalent to mini minimizing uh, free energy. And a key result of singular learning theory is that the expansion of this free energy in large sample uh, depends uh, for the first two uh, order terms on the, the, the loss and some term, some term lambda, which is the effective dimension with a log n factor in front of the lambda. So this lambda is, is sensitive to the to the singularity of uh, of the of the loss landscape. Uh, and uh, as I said earlier, the singularity happens when you cannot make a quadratic expansion around your uh, local minima and the degree of the singularity is defined by the highest uh, exponent uh, when you approximate by this product of uh, monomial here. Uh, and one key prediction of uh, SLT is that uh, for uh, a given when when this loss is is minimized, then the the, the distribution uh, of uh, the of the distribution of stochastic gradient trajectory um, should accumulate around the most singular minimum. So this is a this is if we apply the prediction of SLT naively to stochastic gradient descent because SLT makes prediction about Bayesian posterior. Um, so now I'm going to talk about our experiments. So our our setup is is pretty uh, pretty simple. We tried to, to to take very toy models. So we took uh, yi output data and input data independent of each other, and also each being uh, iid and normally distributed. And we consider one dimensional and two dimensional uh, model of of that form. So here we have a double well, a double well potential, and yeah, here we have an, a two dimensional polynomial. 
with a with a critical line uh, and a critical point at the origin. Um, and generally speaking, this up to constant term, this gives rise to potential of the form Q of W square, and we can write the empirical loss. And when running SGD on this statistical model, we can control the amount of data, the batch size, the learning rate, and the number of iterations. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, the first experiment was to look at what happened when we take a one-dimensional uh, singular uh, potential uh, with, with, two, uh, with two minima, one minima being regular. So uh, here at minus two, we have a regular minima where locally the loss is, uh, the theoretical loss is quadratic. And uh, on the other phase, so at the, on the right-hand side of the potential barrier, uh, we have the singular phase because at W equal two, uh, the potential is uh, is uh, W to the power four. So it's uh, it's so it's a singular potential uh, here. And when we run a stochastic gradient descent on the, on this potential by uniformly uh, initializing distribution at random in a in in a box, uh, for example, between minus three and three. And three, we we see uh, eventually uh, all the trajectory that end up uh, converging toward the uh, the regular phase. So the the regular uh, minima, the non singular one, they uh, they tend to escape toward to uh, the the singular phase toward the singular uh, minima, and um, and eventually they all escape to the, toward the singular minima and. We can see that the the fraction of trajectory escaping the the regular phase um, is uh, is a line. Uh, so the log. So this is the the log of the fraction, which is a uh, it's just a it's just a, a line in terms of of time. So we have a constant uh, rate of decay of uh, trajectory from the regular to the singular phase, and this is pretty. This is. Uh, Compatible with uh, SLT prediction, which says that the posterior should accumulate around the most singular point. Um, and interestingly, here we, we don't see any trajectory coming back to the uh, to the regular phase. So the second experiment was to try to see what's going on when we have two singular phases, one 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 with the one that is uh, more singular than the other. So here we have similar type of potential, but the um, on the left hand side of the potential barrier, the, we have a singular phase that is less singular than the other. You can see here around the, the local minima that the volume uh, is, is smaller, is, is, is like is smaller than for the other. So here we have W to the four, and here uh, we have W to the power six. Uh, and so what's interesting here is that we have a basically a perfect correlation between initialization and where SGD trajectory converge. Uh, so all HDD trajectories that are initialized in the uh, in the regular in the singular phase, they tend to stay in the singular phase, and all trajectories that are initialized in the in the most singular phase also tend to stay in the most singular phase, except for at, at the very initialization. But like the most interesting thing is that we don't see any trajectory from the least singular escaping to the most singular phase. So in fact, we don't see trajectory moving to one or the other minima, and the, the fraction of trajectory escaping from the low singularity phase is constant. Um, yeah, and so I think, and, and I think this suggests that uh, somehow that the noise of SGD must get dampened so that SGD cannot be is not able to exp to escape the the singular phase. Um, yeah, and so so I think it's also interesting to see that there doesn't need to to be any a potential barrier to to see this this sort of effect. So here we took a, a potential where the the gradient is such that uh, it is zero along the line w1 equals zero. And we have a, a singular point here at the origin as well. Um, so the gradient is, the theoretical gradient is zero along this line and zero at the origin. And so, yeah, and so it's interesting to run uh, SGD on this, on this potential because uh, you see that in the case where the, the line w1 equals zero is singular, that is when, when the potential is quadratic, in W uh, is quadratic in W, whether it's this quadratic term in factor of W1, then the, this line is is uh, of zero loss is singular and SGD will get stuck uh, as, as it gets closer to the line. Whereas in the case where the line is is, is regular, that is quadratic in W1, uh, then SGD will, um, will converge toward the most uh, singular point, uh, even though the loss on this line is zero and the theoretical gradient is zero. Um, and um, yeah, and so it's interesting to see again that it, it gets stuck toward the, the singularity and there is no, there is no uh, potential barrier. Um, so one, one of the things that we uh, had a look at was um, also to 
look at the rates of convergence uh, of uh, stochastic gradient descent uh, because it seems that as you as you approach this as you approach the singular line uh, stochastic gradient descent uh, seems to get slower and slower as you approach the, the singular region so uh, we also wanted to see um, how singularities affect the rate of convergence of HDD. Um, and so <clears throat> yeah it's it's not it's not very clear exactly what quantitatively what is the rate of convergence of HGD as you get closer to a singular region. Um, uh, initially, if you take if you do a naive calculation uh, and forget about the noise of HGD, uh, it, it might seem that um, you know in the case of a degree one, uh, in the case of where, where d is one here, you you will have a, an exponential convergence. So this is HGD on a on a regular uh, on a regular potential. Uh, so. Uh, the convergence here is is exponential, and and if if you take a d equal to two, which is a, a singular potential, then HDD uh, you might expect to see a, a power a power low, um, but uh, yeah, I mean that that's not that's not what we observe. But the interesting observation is that compared to uh, SGD in degree one, uh, SGD around a singular region is um, uh, is slower is 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 indeed slower to converge. And in fact, it's uh, slower if you if you put this. Uh, so this is this is log distance, uh, and this is log time. Uh, so it's a log log plot. But if you plot it in in term of, in a linear time, uh, you can see that it's faster than a power law. So, I mean, this is not so surprising because the the noise of HGD will uh, accelerate uh, gradient descent. So we should expect it to be faster than a power law. In fact, uh, but it's it's slower than it's also slower than a, an exponential. Um, uh, because the the carrier is is uh, is under all its uh, its tangent uh, in in log log scale, um, yeah. And so for degree one, as you can see that the noise tends to dominate uh, as you get closer also to the uh, uh, to the minima. Um, okay, so yeah, so, so to try to understand a bit better the distribution of trajectory, we we also. The distribution of HD uh, trajectory, we uh, had a look at uh, uh, Fokker Planck uh, Fokker Planck equation. So the idea is that uh, you know the motivation the motivation here is to uh, try to compare the prediction of SLT, which predicts uh, how the post the patient posterior uh, behave to a distribution of uh, stochastic gradient descent uh, trajectory. Um, and the general idea of Fokker Planck is that uh, if you have a Langevin a Langevin dynamics, so um, so this, which is basically gradient descent plus uh, some Gaussian white noise term, then you can go to a, a, a differential, a partial differential equation over uh, probability uh, density of trajectory, uh, which is a differential equation, uh, which is first order in time and second order in uh, parameter. The first term here is uh, a drift term and the second term uh, uh, here is a, is, a diffusion, is a diffusion term. Uh, and and this d alpha and d alpha beta depend in, uh, in complicated way uh, in uh, the polynomial q, the batch size, uh, the learning rate eta, and the moment of the data distribution. And uh, we have written a report where there is much more detail about the uh, calculation. Um, and in the in the regime where the batch size is uh, much greater than one. Uh, the, the noise uh, become Gaussian thanks to the central limit theorem. And uh, when the number of data points is is also a greater relative to the batch size, then the uh, different batch become uh, uncorrelated. And so we can assume that uh, the uh, the noise is uh, is is Gaussian white noise. And uh, when we take sufficiently low learning slow learning weight, we can uh, we we can do go at the continuous uh, limits. And this uh, relationship between the Langevin dynamics and the Fokker-Planck equation holds. So we we did not solve analytically this uh, this equation, but we did try to do some uh, numerical experiments uh, with it, and uh, we mostly uh, looked at uh, Fokker-Planck on uh, a potential that is uh, quadratic, so a regular potential, um, and we find some agreements between uh, this, the stationary distribution. Uh, of uh, for Kaplan equation and the distribution of uh, SD trajectory. In fact, it's a, it's a, it's pretty good uh, quantitative agreement uh, for the stationary distribution and the uh, and the limit uh, and the limits of, of when time goes to infinity. But this this also and this and this holds also when when the batch are fairly small. Uh, so when the noise even when the noise is, is fairly high, um, and we also have some some agreements when. Um, 
uh, in finite time, not only in, in the stationary distribution, but also when the when the time is, is finite between the Fokker Planck. Uh, so the solution of Fokker Planck equation and the trajectory of SGD on a regular potential. Um, yeah, so we also try to like it's it's worth in progress to look at what's what happened in, in, in singular potential. Um yeah, so to conclude, uh, I think the main takeaway from this talk is that um like as singular learning theory and uh the distribution of SGD trajectory, they sometimes agree and they sometimes seem to disagree. Uh but the important point is that singular uh, region have singular region have an important uh effect on uh, the dynamics of SGD in particular uh, by slowing down the rate of convergence of SGD. And the interesting point here is that the noise of SGD is affected, seems to be affected by the, the singular region and, and the noise of SGD gets dampened as SGD gets closer to a singular region. Um, and, yeah, and so, I mean, the next, the next steps, there are many uh, possible potential direction, but I think it would be uh, interesting to explore a bit more this um, how the covariance of the noise depends on the singularity of, of the singular region of the loss landscape and relate this to uh, the escape probability of, uh, of SGD. Uh, so the probability that uh, SGD escape from a singular region to another singular region, because this is important in the SFT picture uh, to try to understand uh, how, how phase transition happen between different regions of parameter space. Um, also, it would be interesting to look at higher dimension because um, uh, you know, we only took a low dimensional linear model. Uh, the next natural step would be to look at deep linear networks. And there are people actually uh, in the singular learning theory community working on that. Um, and yeah, look at nonlinear activations, so generally trying to get closer to the uh, to, to deep learning uh, practices. Um, yeah, we seem to have also some qualitative disagreement between Fokker Planck and SGD, uh, which uh, we, we don't understand very well yet, and so we want to understand more. And more generally, I think it seems that uh, methods from statistical physics are pretty powerful and useful to uh, understand uh, the learning dynamics and uh, also things that are related to singular learning theory. For example, it would be interesting to explore uh, how the replica techniques uh, apply, applies to uh, the expansion, uh, if it applies to, for example, the expansion of the free energy, which is, um, uh, a log of uh, a log of partition function and, and physicists have been explored all, all sorts of techniques to uh, try to uh, compute this this kind of integrals. Um, yeah, so I, I would just like to finish. I would just like to to thank uh, Nicola Nico Nico Massé who collaborated with me and and gave me lots of feedback and support during this project. I'd like also to thank Edmond Edmond Lau who is doing his PhD on singular learning theory and uh, I had quite a few meetings that were very helpful. Uh, with him and uh, Nishal uh, Nish, who was doing the PIBS fellowship with me during the summer. And we had also lots of great uh, research discussion, uh, the SLT community and PIBS for, for funding and all the support. Um, yeah, thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Guillaume. I think, um, yeah. If this were an in-person talk, there would be like a whole virtual round of applause right now. So like, I think we can all give like a virtual round. Um, let's leave just a second uh, to see if people will write their questions in the chat. Um, so you should be able to reach it via the Q&A function. If not, you can put them in the general chat, I guess, for this time. Uh, let's see. Um, Q&A. I think I don't see yeah, I don't see any question in the, in the Q and A. Oh, okay, yeah, and also the audience can't use the general chat, so you have to use the um, Q and A function. I mean, if not, then maybe I'll start with a question from my end. Um, yeah, which is, sure. Um, yeah, so thanks for this like really interesting introduction to kind of statistical physics and how you can use it to apply um, small models. I guess my question would be. What, what are kind of like the next steps that you see and how relevant can you use this theory to analyze kind of large deep, deep learning models um, that are in right. use today? And then second right. also, what do you think are the safety kind of like applications that come from these approaches? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't have much time to talk about this, uh, but uh, basically, so, I mean, this is something that a lot of people uh, on in singular learning theory think and work on also uh, as well. So, I mean, one one key interesting thing for, for the for the uh, safety of, of deep neural network is particularly uh, 
like having a better interpretability of, of deep neural network during the training. So there's been some evidence that uh, there are phase transitions that happen during the training of, of deep learning. So, uh, you know, there's this paper about uh, grokking uh, and the principle of superposition. So, you know, where you can see, uh, like, for example, in grokking, you, you can see like a huge uh, bump uh, in the loss uh, and, uh, you know, like people conjecture that there might be some phase transition uh, happening there, and so S and SLT is is SLT makes uh, explicit prediction in the case of Bayesian statistical model that um, as as you increase the number as you increase the number of sample, uh, you will you will be in some region uh, and you will have you will have some loss and some uh, some effective dimension which depend on the singularities. Uh, as you see more data, there will be a critical. A crit they, they might, it might happen that there is a critical time at which uh, you will uh, face transition into another region of parameter space, uh, and this is this is due to this trade-off between uh, between the loss and um, and the singularity of uh, of the of the statistical model. And uh, we can measure this singular. We can measure the well. The idea is that you, you try to measure you try to measure the degree you try to measure the degree of singularity of some of of like of some re of the region of parameter of space that you're in. And when you see uh, a phase transition, you could, you could see this measure uh, going up uh, very fast. And so you could keep track like this as uh, you could keep track uh, keep keep track of phase transition like this. Um, so the key idea is like we want to have some principal way of measuring uh, phase transition in neural network, and and then a bit a further step is to try to uh, when we when we are able to detect this phase transition, which you know we, we are not able to do that yet, but when we are able to to detect them, uh, we can try to understand what's going on during this phase transition. How uh, how do new structure in the in the model uh, emerge during this this phase transition? Uh, because it might be easier to keep track of what's happening specifically during the phase transition because during phase transition there are important uh, transformation happening in the network and we want to understand what are these because they might correspond to uh you know important capabilities emerging important new circuits being discovered like you know a, a like a simple example would be you know induction heads new or or like something like that but um yeah so yeah, it's 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 another tool that you want to have to deploy during the training of neural network to keep track of important change in the neural network. So you can you can stop and then look at try to understand what are these new structure. Interesting. Um, do you think there are, or do you think there are some potential applications for using these this kind of theory to kind of also model? Um, biological learning, for instance, or do you think that it's it's kind of like a simply um, machine learning kind of applications? Yeah. yeah, so I, I yeah, I don't know, I don't know, well, I don't know much about, uh, you know, developmental biology, but I know that there are, like there are people uh, in, the, in the SLT community. So Daniel Murphy has, has been giving talks about uh, developmental biology and how, uh, you know, uh, this idea that you have critical points and phase transition at, at which new uh, new structure might emerge during the, the development of uh, you know I don't know maybe uh, uh, brains or other biological uh, systems I'm not I'm not very familiar with those uh, but um, I think I think there is there is a small niche literature of people trying to look at uh, trying to look at this uh, uh, using like looking into critical point and phase transition in develop in in developmental biology. Uh, but I, I don't think it's, I mean, I, as far as I know, I, I don't know uh, how far, how deep it goes and, and how useful it is. Yeah. All right. Sounds good. Um, thank you so much. Yeah. I, thank you. That, 